Hello. My name is Jamie Lecker. I am the Director of Nutrition at BioServe, and today I'm happy to be here with you and present my talk entitled Improving the Postoperative Recovery of Rodents Through Nutrition and Enrichment. Today I'm going to talk about the role nutrition and enrichment can play in improving the postoperative recovery of rodents. Surgical procedures do produce stress in animals, which subsequently alters their metabolism. Further, pain, surgery, and anesthesia can lead to a decrease in both food and water consumption postoperatively. So this necessitates that we want to pay particular attention to the nutrition, the nutrition and the stress levels of animals postoperatively, specifically paying attention to the diet, diet composition, method of delivery, and the palatability of the diet, as well as we want to do our best to minimize introducing any additional stress in the animals to facilitate a quicker recovery. So first I'm going to give Just lost my slides here. First, I'm going to give oh, one second. I'm having a little bit of problems here with my slides. I lost access to my slides. Hold on one moment here. Okay, first I'm going to talk briefly about the metabolic changes that can occur in response to surgery. Um, specifically, I like to give some background information just to give you some rationale for why you may want to include some of what I talk about into your protocol. Next, I'm going to talk about what you can do from um, a nutritional standpoint to help your animals recover quickly, specifically talking about hydration, acclimation, diet composition and delivery, as well as present some data from the literature showing how postoperative diets have been successful in particular models. Next, I'll talk about specific, specific aspects of postoperative care, um, specifically focusing on ways to use enrichment to minimize um, stress in the animals, um, as well as minimizing handling. Also, I'll talk about using oral dosing, again, to minimize stress in handling in the animals. And then finally, I'll talk about some protocols um, that we've learned working with other investigators. We're very fortunate to be able to work with a lot of different researchers in our field and get a lot of feedback on learning on what works in specific protocols. So rodents do have high energy requirements, and this is due to their small size yet high metabolic rate. Additionally, rodents have very limited fat storage to mobilize in times of increased energy needs, and this is even more pronounced in young animals. Rodents also have a very high surface area relative to body weight, so this increases energy just required for thermoregulation. On average, a mouse will consume about 3 to 6 grams of diet per day, which is about 12 to 18 grams per 100 gram body weight. And on average, a rat will consume about 15 to 30 grams of diet per day which is about five to six grams per 100 gram body weight. Um, that can vary, again, based on the size and the strain of the rat. Sur surgery does induce a hypermetabolic state in the animals, um, so we want to make sure that uh, we pay attention to nutrition postoperatively. Um, they are in a hypermetabolic state, so they do have increased energy requirements. Postoperative nutrition is important to rodent survival and recovery after surgery, again, to minimize weight loss and protein loss and help the animals retain to the pre return to their preoperative body weight and metabolic state as quickly as possible. We know that rodents do have a reduced food and water consumption for at least one to two days postoperatively, and this can be even longer depending on the degree of the surgery and trauma in the animal. So we want to do our best to minimize the impact that surgery does have on the animal model. So during surgery, there are changes that occur metabolically in the animal. Specifically, there is an increased metabolic rate in the animal. And unfortunately, this is occurring at a time when the animals do have a decreased appetite and um, are less likely to eat, so we see that weight loss. Um, once the animal's glycogen is depleted from the liver, the animal is going to switch to um, 
generating new glucose in liver and kidney and using amino acids as substrates for this. We see an increase in both glucagon and insulin. Um, this ratio does favor glucagon, and as a result, there is a um, result in hyperglycemia that is observed. Um, this hyperglycemia is also um, linked with insulin resistance in the animals, and what this does is it decreases the uptake of glucose by skeletal muscle and adipocytes and keeps it available for um, very critical tissues and organs that are involved in wound healing, um, such as the central nervous system, kidney, wound tissue, and hematological cells. This insulin resistance that occurs also prevents ketogenesis or the use of fatty acids as an energy source um, so that the body does shift to breaking down muscle protein and using amino acids as um, substrates for gluconeogenesis. We also see an increase in cortisol, which is released in response to stress. This does promote proteolysis and insulin resistance. So as I mentioned, we see this increase in tissue protein catabolism. Um, so it's a hypercatabolic and hypermetabolic state, so increased protein catabolism, increased energy requirements. And this skeletal muscle that is broken down, um, the amino acids are used for gluconeogenesis, as I mentioned. They're also used for substrates for new protein um, in tissue healing, also in the liver for the production of acute phase response proteins, um, which are involved in the immune system, hematological cells, um, and wound healing. We see an increased nitrogen loss or negative nitrogen balance that can last several days or even longer, again, depending on the degree of, of injury to the animal. So there's an overall increased need for both energy and protein in the animals. And this is all happening because the body is placing a priority on wound repair, hoping that that's gonna occur before that breakdown in body protein and loss of body weight becomes a threat to the animal's survival. So this next slide, sorry, I'm still having some problems with my slides here, I'm just trying to. This next slide shows the um, changes that occur in response to injury, um, specifically the um, increase in the resting metabolic rate and the increased loss of nitrogen or muscle protein from the body. So the top slide does show um, that you have an increased resting metabolic rate or hypermetabolic rate um, proportional to the degree of injury. And burn injuries really increase the metabolic rate both in humans and animals, and this presents a real challenge in recovering the animals and getting them back to um, their normal body weight. The lower graph shows the increase in nitrogen excretion, um, which is the protein loss from the body. And although there is an increased protein turnover, so an increase in um, synthesis and breakdown, the breakdown far exceeds that um, that is synthesized. So it's important to first talk about the preoperative metabolic state. The nutritional status of the animal is a very important determinant of how well the animal is going to recover prior to surgery. Um, so we really want to make sure that the animals are in the best condition preoperatively that they can be. Withholding food in rodents is not necessary. Um, rodents do not vomit. Um, additionally, it's been demonstrated that the stomach is emptied in about six hours in rodents. So in general, it's recommended not to fast them for more than four to six hours. There are quite profound effects of fasting on body weight. Um, in a series of studies done in rats, they showed that after six hours, there was a 5% loss in body weight. After 12 hours, there was a 9% loss. And after 18 hours, there was a 13% loss in body weight. And the loss in liver weight was even more severe. It's also important to pay attention if you do fast animals when that food is removed, noting that animals, the rodents are nocturnal, so they eat during the dark phase. So paying attention to how long the animals actually have been without food is important. Water should never be withheld prior to surgery. We want to make sure the animals are well hydrated going into surgery. And a preoperative analgesia has really been demonstrated to minimize a decrease in food intake that we see um, after surgery. 
A common complication that can affect rodents recovering from surgery or anesthesia is dehydration. So we always advocate not putting anything in the water that will affect flavor and deter the rodents from drinking. You want to make sure the water stays very palatable so they do stay hydrated. Also, it's important to note that um, water and food intake do go hand in hand. So if an animal stops drinking, they're also likely to stop eating. So that's why it's important foremost to make sure the animal's well hydrated. Electrolyte support can be very effective in getting animals to drink and stay hydrated. Um, it can stimulate water consumption and can be delivered either in a water bottle or um, placed in a bowl at cage level. Gel products are very successful. There are a lot available specifically for rodents. These can be both a source of food and water for the animals. This is an image showing a rat that was being acclimated to an electrolyte supplement prior to surgery, and you can see the rat is willingly consuming the electrolyte supplement. So that leads us into acclimation. As I just mentioned, um, the rat in the previous slide was being acclimated to something they were going to receive postoperatively. Acclimation to new diets or treats can really be critical um, to successful postoperative recovery. It's really important to expose animals to postoperative diets or treat prior to surgical procedures. Um, the eighth edition of the guide actually mentions the importance of acclimation, stating, regardless of whether the animals are quarantined, newly received animals should be given a period of physiologic, behavioral, and nutritional acclimation before their use. So in our case for surgery, it's important not only to acclimate the animals to their surroundings, but to also acclimate them to anything you're going to provide them postoperatively to help them recover. By exposing animals to postoperative diets or treats, you're allowing them to acclimate to the diet when they're healthy. It allows you, the investigator, to determine what flavors or formats each animal model prefers. We know that different strains um, within mice or rats can have different preferences in flavor or texture or format of diets. We know that rodents, particularly rats, can be neophobic, um, so they're not going to take to something the first time. They need a day or two to get used to it um, and evaluate it. And the acclimation period has really proven to increase the acceptance of postoperative diets. <clears throat> so this preconditioning um, will help us determine which treats will be most effective in achieving results. We can determine flavor preferences by a simple taste test. Um, it allows the animal time to adjust and try new treats in their cage. Um, we have investigators that do very simple flavor preferences. They'll just present the animal with um, a couple different pellets of different flavors and then can visually observe which they prefer and they'll now use that flavor postoperatively. So again, you can increase the acceptability of postoperative diets, medicated treats, or enrichment for quicker recovery. We actually have facilities that say that if the animals are not acclimated, surgery is postponed. So they have found that to be so critical in the success of their postoperative recovery that they require it in their protocol. So I just want to point out that um, nutritional supplementation or early enteral nutrition is a first line of defense in helping the animals recover postoperatively. However, it's not going to completely prevent weight loss or protein loss, um, but it can improve calorie and nitrogen balance during this hypercatabolic state. So our goal with enteral nutrition or nutritional support is to maintain body weight and protein stores to help minimize that protein catabolism and weight loss that occurs postoperatively. So we want to provide um, calories and a nitrogen source or protein to help facilitate protein synthesis in the animals and provide them energy. We want to make sure the diet is highly palatable, nutrient-dense, and nutritionally complete. And we want to make sure we're giving the animals sufficient protein to heal their wounds and generate new tissue. So we do know that rodents are going to have a decrease in food intake postoperatively. So we want to try our best to get them eating as quickly as possible postoperatively. We want to provide a high-quality diet soon after surgery to prevent this calorie malnutrition and decrease mortality. As I mentioned, that hydration and feed intake are very closely linked, so we want to make sure the animals get supplemental fluid um, or electrolyte support therapy if needed. And also, because it's been demonstrated that severe pain results in loss of food and water intake, we want to make sure that the animals are not experiencing pain so, pain so that we're not further um, exasperating the situation. 
So one of the things that we can do to get the animals eating quicker is to stimulate their appetite. And one of the ways to do this is to use flavorings in foods. Many years ago, we had worked with NIH to try to determine what flavors would be very successful in rodents to get them to eat um, when they were not feeling well. And surprisingly, one of the forerunners in this was a bacon flavoring. It's been demonstrated to be very successful in stimulating the appetite of rodents. Other flavors that work very well in rodents are chocolate and berry and fruit flavors. So the aroma is going to help entice them and stimulate their appetite, and the flavor can also help aid in food intake. Providing an alternative diet to their typical chow can also stimulate food intake. Just like in humans, um, in animals, a diet with a novel different taste may entice rodents to eat. We know that when we're not feeling well, we tend to eat different things than we would if we were feeling healthy. So it's the same for rodents. Just like in humans as well, variety can increase food intake in rodents. It's also important to note learned food aversions. So if a rodent associates a specific feed with not feeling well, they're less likely to consume this diet. So it's really important to get to know your animals and know what, what formats and flavors they like and are willing to consume. So if the animal's not willing to consume a nutritionally complete diet immediately recovering from surgery, we found that treats work wonderful as appetite stimulants, providing them simple treats such as dried fruits, nuts, seeds, um, even peanut butter, just to stimulate their appetite, um, get their GI moving, and then follow up with a normal diet. Specific diets that work very well postoperatively um, are gel diets. These are um, made with both food and water. So if this was the only thing the animal were to eat, they would get all their nutrition and water they needed in a given day. Another advantage of gel diets is that they're very soft and very easy for the animal to consume. Um, and we always recommend for all post-operative diets to place them at cage floor level for animals that cannot get to the hopper. So this is really important, and you'll see this as a bullet um, under many of my slides. Again, always reminding you to provide the post-operative diets cage level. Another diet that works very well post-operatively are purified diets. These are made with very refined, pure ingredients in simple form. They're low residue, so they're very easy for the animals to digest and absorb and have been documented to improve post-operative recovery. As we mentioned, the animals are in a hypercatabolic and hypermetabolic state, so providing the animals with diets higher in protein and higher in fat um, work very well. So if the animal is consuming less diet, having a higher fat diet will give them those additional calories and the higher protein level can help the animal recover. Um, these diets are both calorie and nutrient dense. <clears throat> the high fat diets also tend to be softer. Um, softer diets tend to work well postoperatively, uh, whether it's as, as extreme as a liquid diet or a soft pellet or a gel or a dough, just easier for the animals to consume and they're more willing to eat it. Um, again, placing these at cage level allows the animal to consume it readily without having to get to the cage hopper or the food hopper. Liquid diets um, are very, very successful for postoperative recovery, both in humans and many different types of animals. Liquid diets are made with purified ingredients, which, as I mentioned, are um, very refined, very easy for the animals to ingest and digest. They're ideal for gastrointestinal surgery recovery. Um, they have minimal residue because of their efficient absorption of nutrients. So I have several examples of the success of liquid diets in postoperative recovery, and I want to present some of those just to give you some um, some success stories. In this particular model, um, this was an intestinal resection model in mice, specifically a small bowel resection. Um, mice had been receiving solid diets post-op, and the investigators observed a very high mortality rate. Um, and they attributed this to complications from disruption of wound healing by the pre-ingested food. And they found that even if they fasted the animals for 48 hours prior to surgery, they still saw this high mortality rate and um, disruption of the wound. So what they did was they switched the mice over to a liquid diet three days preoperatively. Um, they gave them the same diet postoperatively. Um, and what they documented was that they then had a 95% survival rate when using the liquid diet both pre-op and um, for the recovery. So this was the most significant impact on the success of their model was just switching the pre- and postoperative diet. 
They then took it a step further and looked at um, whether the, if the liquid diet contained a high protein level or a standard protein level, how this would affect the recovery of the animals. So the standard protein was 17% calories from protein and the high protein was 45% calories from protein. The diets were matched in all other nutrients and were isocaloric. Um, so they had the same calories per milliliter of liquid diet. The authors um, documented that the caloric intake was the same, so there was no difference. The mice didn't consume more of the high protein or the <clears throat> standard protein diet. However, the weight loss was significantly less in the animals receiving the high protein diet. They actually returned to their preoperative body weight on um, day eight post-surgery versus day 22 post-surgery. So that's a pretty significant difference. Um, and they also saw an increase in total lean and fat mass in the high protein group compared to the low protein group. And this is just um, the um, a graph right out of their, of their publication just documenting that um, difference in weight gain in the animals in the high protein diet, which is the black line, versus the standard protein, which is the blue line. So it's a pretty significant difference in um, post-operative weight gain that they observed. This next study um, shows that um, providing a different enteral nutrition in the post-hypercatabolic -hyper state in um, burns, so this is rats that received um, a burn injury, so showing that providing a liquid diet post-operatively really made a dramatic difference in the recovery of the animals. In this particular study, um, as I mentioned, the rats did receive a burn injury. They were given either a standard rodent diet or a liquid diet. The liquid diet was both higher in protein and in fat, um, and they were pear fed, so the animals did consume the same number of calories. And what they found was that the animals that were on the liquid diet, um, after five weeks of healing, they had returned, actually gained a little bit of weight relative to their pre-burn weight, whereas the animals on the grain-based diet um, still were underweight relative to their pre-burn weight. They also documented improved protein balance during this hypermetabolic response to injury, um, higher protein in the serum and muscle, and higher acute phase response proteins um, generated by the liver. So although this particular study doesn't show um, exactly what specifically in the liquid diet was responsible for the increased recovery, it does show the dramatic um, effect that changing your post-operative diet can have on your recovery model. And as I mentioned, that um, recovering from burn injuries does really significantly increase the metabolism in rodents. So this is a hard model to get back to pre-burn state, pre-burn um, weight. This next study looks at um, the difference between a purified diet versus a standard grain bait diet. Um, the post-operative diets used here were um, a standard purified rodent diet, AIN 76A, versus a grain diet. These animals were acclimated to the diet seven days prior to surgery and were not fasted. Um, and what they found was rats consuming the grain diet after their liver surgery had a 20 to 30 percent decrease in food intake postoperatively. They did not observe this in the animals consuming the purified diet. They continued to eat at preoperative level. Further, the animals on the grain diet didn't return to their preoperative body weight until day 14 versus the animals on the purified diet who returned by day seven. Interestingly, they also demonstrated that there was a lower feed efficiency in the animals on the grain diet. Um, that's the gram of body weight gained per the gram of diet consumed. So even at the same level of feed take, the animals on the purified diet did put on more weight per gram of diet consumed. Um, they did not see this effect in the sham group, so there was no difference on weight gain for the grain versus the purified. So this was specifically an effect in the postoperative state. So they found the purified diets did promote a quicker recovery postoperatively. This was um, this next um, study was one that we did in collaboration with Taconic, trying to help um, rats in a category E procedure. Um, so they weren't receiving analgesia, helping them recover or gain their body, regain their body weight after this procedure quicker. So there were six groups um, that were matched on weight. Um, the first two groups did not receive surgery. The first was on the regular feed, and the second received the regular feed and the postoperative diet. Postoperative diet was a soft pelleted diet with bacon flavoring. Um, it was a higher fat um, and a little bit higher in protein diet. 
Group C and D um, also had surgery, but they received um, regular feed. Um, D received regular feed and moistened feed. Groups E and F both received the post-operative diet, um, the difference being that group E was acclimated two days prior to the surgery and group F did not receive acclimation to the post-operative diet. And what we observed was that the animals that did receive the post-operative diet um, showed less of a loss of body weight compared to the animals um, receiving the standard feed or moistened feed um, and were not significantly different from controls by days five and seven. Um, this shows the difference in body weight comparing baseline to postoperative day seven. And you can see the animals that did receive the postoperative diet, groups E and F, did return to their preoperative body weights um, at, at the end of the seven day period, where animals that received the standard diet or the moistened chow did not return to their preoperative body weight by this period. So we observed that the rats that were supplemented with the postoperative diet did have less body weight loss relative to the rats on the standard feed. Um, they returned to their preoperative body weight within five days and the animals on the standard feed had not returned by day seven. Um, importantly, there was no effect on the research model development as measured by spin rates when using the postoperative diet. So this suggests that there was improved recovery in the animals receiving the postoperative diet, um, specifically in this category B procedure in rats. So as we talked about, um, there is an increased stress on the animals when they are recovering from surgery. So we really want to do our best to minimize introducing any stress, additional stress in the animals. Um, increased stress has been implicated in poor wound healing. It can have profound effects on the physiology of the animal, and it really can delay recovery and increase energy requirements. Um, there was a study out of Massachusetts General Hospital Department of Surgery which did a beautiful job documenting this mind-body relationship in regards to wound healing. And what they found was in rats, um, they were looking at wound healing after burn injury, and what they found was the rats that were either group housed or provided with enrichment had a much quicker recovery wound healing compared to the animals that were singly housed. And they actually linked this to changes in the brain uh, responsible for um, stress. So they found the animals that were either group housed or provided enrichment did have less stress and um, ultimately healed quicker compared to the animals that were singly housed. So one of the ways that we can decrease um, stress in animals postoperatively is using edible enrichment to minimize handling of the animals. Um, whether this be for an assessment of pain, mobility, or wound healing. So in regards to pain, we know that the animals do prefer treats and are very interested in treats, so providing these to them and seeing a lack of interest may be an indicator that something's wrong. Um, you can also use the treats to see how mobile the animal is, um, placing treats on top of the cage or in front of the cage and seeing if the animal moves to them. Uh, we actually had an investigator that was very creative, and what she did was she put treats um, in different corners of the cage, and then she would look the next day to see which ones were consumed. So it gave her an idea of how mobile the animals were in the cages. Um, you can place treats on top of the cage to evaluate um, incisions or wound healing without actually having to pick the animals up. Um, again, this allows minimizing handling and decreased stress. Treats can stimulate um, feed intake in rodents with poor appetite, so again, it can get them jump-started. Um, also, it can just provide them with an opportunity of enrichment um, or foraging opportunity, which we know can decrease stress in animals. It can also act as um, a distraction from not feeling well or even from their incisions. Um, these two images just show that you can give some sort of enrichment for any situation. Um, the animal on the left who can't use um, his paws to pick up a treat can be given a larger block so that they can have some um, form of edible enrichment. And the animal on the right um, prefers to take his treats and carry them back to his shelter um, where he'd like to be. Another way to use um, treats or feed to minimize stress um, is to use stress-free oral dosing. Um, we know that injections and handling of the animals do introduce stress. And Dr. Lisa Leone of the U.S. Army Research Institute, she documented this um, 
this injection stress um, by measuring core body temperature and showing the hypothermia that was um, introduced when animals were injected. Um, and this was completely eliminated when the animals were allowed to voluntarily consume the medication in a treat. So medications can be incorporated into diets or treats um, in highly palatable forms that can mask bitter taste and odors of medications. And again, it gives you an opportunity to minimize stress from handling the animals at a time when they're, they're trying to heal. There are a lot of publications out there which document the success of using stress-free oral dosing in different formats um, from chocolate spreads to peanut butter, gel diets, nutritionally complete diets. Um, and document the animals do consume it, um, some as quickly as 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, the drugs for this must be in oral form. You need to be able to monitor or verify consumption and make sure that the drug is in an appropriate formulation. And all drugs aren't palatable, so not oral drugs can be used in this way. From our experience, we've seen drugs such as cyclosporin can be very difficult to mask. So just to summarize what we went over, animals postoperatively are in a hypercatabolic and hypermetabolic state, so they have an increased need for both protein and energy. Um, they have increased protein turnover, however, the degradation of proteins exceeding that's what synthesized, so they are in a negative nitrogen balance. Things we can do from the nutritional side is making sure the animal is in the best state possible preoperatively, making sure the animal's hydrated, providing nutritionally complete diets or treats post-operatively to get the animal eating and jump-started, making sure we pay attention to the composition and form of the diet, providing animals with either liquid diets or a softer form, um, and making it easily accessible for them to get to. And most importantly, making sure that the diet is palatable, that's something that's going to stimulate their appetite and they're going to want to eat. Things we can do from the enrichment side, um, using edible enrichment, to facilitate either dosing or monitoring of the animals and really decreasing stress just by giving them an, a reward. Uh, we had an investigator that shared her story um, in regards to enrichment. She needed to um, monitor improvements in dexterity in her rats after spinal cord injury and she placed treats in the top of the cage and the rats had to pull it down and she was able to monitor how dexterous they were. Um, so after a couple of days of doing this, she found that when she walked into the room, those little paws went up for that treat. So it just shows the power of rewarding the animals, um, how effective it can be on your model. So next I'm going to go over some protocols um, that we've learned working with other investigators, um, just to give you an idea of the success stories that we've heard. Um, this first is just a, um, just a really basic sample post-operative care plan. Uh, we always recommend an acclimation to the recovery diet at least two to three days prior to surgery to make sure it's something that's not novel to the animal at the time of recovery. Feeding the post-operative diet cage level um, for about five to seven days. Um, providing diets that are soft, um, whether it's a dough, a soft diet, a gel diet, or liquid diet. And we do recommend providing these fresh daily because they are soft and we want to keep them that way and keep them fresh. Higher moisture products tend to go bad quicker, so providing it fresh daily is a good idea. It also gives you an idea of how much the animals are consuming if you change it out each day. You can include a post-operative analgesia in a treat or a diet form, if appropriate, to minimize handling. We always recommend keeping the standard feed in the hopper and keeping your standard watering system to give the animals option if they prefer to eat that. Um, providing um, basic enrichment in the cage, such as shelter or nesting opportunity, can help decrease stress levels, which is important in recovery. And then it's a good idea to give some edible enrichment, whether you're giving it for foraging or a reward or for monitoring. Um, it can really help decrease stress levels in the rodents. Um, this is a um, protocol that was shared to us by Nancy DeFelice, who's been wonderful with her animals and really creating a wonderful plan to help her animals recover and have minimal complications. So they do ICV cannulations in the rats, um, and they require a four to seven day acclimation period um, to whatever they're giving the animals postoperatively. They also acclimate them to the placebo tablet, so they do use the voluntary oral dosing in a treat form, so the animals are, are acclimated to the placebo. <clears throat> Her animals are also given um, some enrichment. They're given a nylon bone, nesting material, and shelters. 
Um, preoperatively, the animals are given their medicated tablet and some of the gel diet they'll get postoperatively. On the day of the surgery, they're getting, they're getting their medicated tablet, they're getting their food cage level and the gel diet. And then they do this postoperatively for four to seven days, um, and they report very few complications when they have this protocol in place. The next example is from Kim Wasco at Drexel. Um, Kim does a lot of um, surgeries and um, studies on wound healing, and she was having some um, high mortality and morbidity rates in this particular model. Um, it involved doing wound checks quite regularly because that was part of the study. Um, and involved putting the animals under anesthesia to do these wound checks. So she was seeing a lot of dehydration and loss of body weight, um, and the animals were not doing well. So Kim put together a very comprehensive plan to turn around her model. So what she did was um, she acclimated her animals, knowing that the rats are neophobic. She started giving a preoperative um, analgesia, and she also um, incorporated nutrition and hydration supplements in the cage. Additionally, what Kim did um, to facilitate these wound checks is that she started acclimating the rats to her by handling them and giving them a reward after the handling. So she was able to eliminate having to do um, anesthesia, putting the animals under anesthesia to do these wound checks, and it really turned around her model. She reported minimized weight loss, dehydration, and an overall decreased recovery time. This is one of her very, very happy rats. This next um, example is out of NIH, and they had an undersized knockout model. Um, this model um, was only about three to five grams body weight post weaning. They needed to have a cranial injection at day 14, and they were observing very significant weight loss, um, and the model was not viable. So they implemented a very rigorous um, nutritional support plan by incorporating um, pre-surgical supplements into their protocol so the animals could get acclimated and help get to a higher body weight going into surgery. Um, this included protein, whey protein, which is a very good protein, both pre- and post-operatively, um, a liquid diet, ensure, and fresh fruit. Post-operatively, um, to increase caloric intake and keep the animals hydrated, they included an oral electrolyte um, supplement, as well as several forms of post-operative diets and protein supplements. They documented increased weight gain on the supplemental care program and uh, overall improved body condition score and decreased mortality. So they were able to get a viable model by incorporating uh, a post-operative nutritional supplementation plan. Finally, this last example shows um, how to use edible enrichment in a post-surgical model. Uh, this specifically was a meniscal tear for an osteoarthritic model, and they just used dried fruit and nutritionally complete bacon-flavored pellets <clears throat> provided cage level immediately after surgery. And they documented that these treats um, provided a source of enrichment for the animals. It also gave them nutritional supplementation, so it minimized weight loss postoperatively. It also allowed them to do assessment of postoperative mobility and weight bearing to see how well the animals can move around by putting the treats at different spaces in the cage and observing the movement without having to handle them. They were also able to do routine checks of the knee incisions by placing a treat on top of the cage and having the animals stretch up, so again, without actually having to handle the animals. And they also found that giving these treats did provide a distraction from the incision site. So it really improved the recovery of their animals postoperatively. So as you can see, if you invest the time to establish protocols for your research, you can see a significant improvement in recovery. You get healthier animals, quicker recovery, and less stress. We all know that unstressed animals provide more reliable data and better science. Um, we know the response of an, of an animal to surgery can be a variable itself. So by helping the animal recover in um, a non-stressful environment and providing them with that nutritional supplementation can really improve their recovery postoperatively. Thank you so much for attending my presentation today, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time.
So the question here is, is there a reason you are using um, Rimadyl and not Meloxicam? So we have investigators that use um, Rimadyl and we have investigators that use Meloxicam. So it really just depends on the model and the investigator's needs. So the next question is, are there any specific recommendations you would have for post-op support of rats with spinal cord injuries? Um, again, if the animals are not able to move around in the cage very well, um, providing them something cage level um, and liquid diets probably would be my first line of defense for helping them recover. Question, did you state that the use of preemptive analgesics lead to decreased food consumption? Oops. Do I see the rest of this? Um, no, the use of um, preemptive analgesics would prevent um, that decrease in food consumption that you see post-op. So providing the animals with analgesia prior to going into surgery can help um, decrease <clears throat> that loss of appetite. So it will help the animals recover quicker. Sorry if I was confusing on that. I don't know how to see the rest of these questions. Um, I've experienced seriously cachetic mice that have quit eating due to tumors or chemotherapy. I'm trying to see the rest of this. Sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing the rest of the question. One second here. Okay, now I see it. So I have experienced seriously cachetic mice that have quit eating due to tumors or chemotherapy um, just by, that have made a recovery just by giving them um, the bacon softies. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yes, those post-operative diets um, that are highly palatable really can turn around um, your animals. Next question, after abdominal, sorry. After abdominal surgery on rodents, a high calorie supplement like NutriCal is applied to pieces of food and placed in an easy to reach place like the corner of their cage. The animals crawl around on their bellies upon coming out of the anesthesia. There is a high chance that the animals crawling over the NutriCal and getting it on their non-continuous abdominal sutures. If the animals are housed in pairs, is there a risk of the rats chewing on their cage mates? neutral sutures and causing them to come undone? If so, is there another strategy you would suggest for this situation post-op? Um, so the liquid diet, um, if you have a liquid diet, you can feed them in um, liquid diet feeding tubes um, or you could feed it in a water bottle so that may prevent some of it from getting on their bodies. Um, the liquid diet feeding tubes only comes out when the animal um, licks the diet out so that may prevent it from getting on the animals. Um, if the, you know, if the NutriCal is not working, um, possibly trying a soft diet or a gel diet that may not um, get on the animals as much. In terms of post-operative wound repair diet, which supplement was most efficient to accelerate this process and immunity? So I've seen the most success in the literature on using um, the liquid diets. They seem to work really well in helping the animals recover. So I would say um, the liquid diets, whether it's a rodent, um, nutritionally complete rodent form, or I've even seen success using, using um, the human available forms. So what sort of post-operative nutritional support would you recommend for models of head and neck cancer who have oral tumors surgically removed? Um, 
again, using the, the liquid diet may be your best bet. Um, we typically recommend soft diets um, for any animals that have um, difficulty chewing or consuming food, but I would recommend using the liquid diets. It probably would be the easy for the animals um, and they're getting their food and water in one source. Is there a recipe for Jello with whey protein and what are quantities added? Um, yes, I do have a reference for that and I'd be happy to email you um, the formulation that was used to make that high protein supplement for the rodent. So I certainly can email that to you so you can try that in your model. Um, will you provide this PowerPoint as a download? I'd love to have this to show some of our researchers. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd be more than happy to share that with you, and I can certainly send you um, a copy of the presentation. Uh, next question is, what would you suggest for rodents that are in metabolism cages? Um, some of these metabolism cages might allow you to use a liquid diet if you can hang the feeder in there. Um, that also can let you, using the liquid diets, um, typically in the feeders, you can doc document exactly how much the animals are consuming, which I know is important for these types of studies, so that might be a good approach here. Next question, is there any concern of placing gel on the floor of the cage? Um, and this comes up often, but it's widely used in a um, a very common method of delivering the gel diets. Typically, they're kept in the container that they come in, so it may be a small um, plastic container, or they can be transferred out into um, a Petri dish or a bowl, again, just making it easy for the animals to get to. Next question is, how do you medicate the treats? Um, there's different approaches that have been used. Um, the, the medications can actually be incorporated in to the formula prior to manufacturing so that they're homogeneously mixed in. Um, and then you can give the small treat to the animals with the medication in there. Um, we've actually seen investigators that will pipette the medication on top of a treat and the treats will just absorb it in and then they feed it that way. Um, other investigators mix the medication in um, with a liquid diet um, or in peanut butter or a chocolate spread. So there are different options of doing this depending on, on your protocol and your needs. <clears throat> Next question is how to offer the liquid diets to the rodents. Um, the liquid diets can be fed in liquid diet feeding tubes. Again, these have an opening on the bottom that allows the animal to lick the diet out and it's very low towards the bottom of the cage so it's easy for the animals to get out. Um, depending on the formulation, some of them can be put into a um, water sipper bottle so they can get it out that way. Uh, next question, um, can we place the gel dye in the floor of the cage? Um, yeah, ultimately this is up to the policies at your institution, but if you have a good justification for providing the diet to the animals um, cage level, putting it on a dish or um, a bowl, because it will help them recover. Um, generally, it's not an issue getting this through. Do you know of any nutrition enrichment that is calorically neutral? We do metabolism research, and I don't think dried fruit or bacon would be a good idea. Um, if you really want to control and know exactly what your animals are consuming, Using purified diets um, can be the best approach. Um, they're very reproducible and consistent. Um, again, using a liquid diet that's in purified form can allow you to monitor feed intake. So that um, these diets are used in a lot of nutritional research and nutritional studies, so that may be a good option for your protocol. <clears throat> What is your weighing routine postoperatively, um, daily, or do you leave them be if they appear fine due to the potential stress of weighing? Um, yes, if the animals appear to be, the animals appear to be consuming their diet and you can um, weigh their feed intake as a way of knowing if they are consuming it, 
um, appear to be mobile and not um, experiencing any pain. Uh, they don't need to be weighed routinely. Typically, in the in the research I presented, they were being weighed, weighed routinely because um, that was, um, you know, part of the of the research design. But it's it's not necessary. Okay. Next question. What appetite stimulant was used in the post-operative care protocol? Um, so the different appetite stimulants that can be used, um, you can use flavored treats, nutritionally complete treats, um, or what works really well is very small um, dried fruit. We have found that to be very successful, not only in rodents, but also in rabbits and primates as well. So just using um, some dried fruit works very, very well. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, it is related to an infectious model. The animal received the pathogen and in some period of time we, we sacrifice how we can relieve some of the symptoms of the infection in general, one or two days of them and mostly fever. Um, so from a diet standpoint, um, I'm not sure if you're, you're finding that the animals are um, consuming feed. If they're not, I would try switching them over to a post-operative diet um, and see if just getting the animals eating um, can help them recover a little quicker. Um, again, the question, what appetite stimulants are you using? Um, we're using dried fruit, nuts, seeds, um, and flavored um, pellets and treats um, that may have that bacon flavoring in it. Um, a post-operative diet with flavoring can really help stimulate the appetite. Okay, I think that answers all the questions. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to um, send you a response on anything if um, something should come up later. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation today and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.